Tonight's event is really special for me, and it's special because it's my first. I'm in week three as executive director, um, and I'm hoping that I see all of you and many more members and non-members at future events, and especially our annual gala, which is May 18th, so please mark your calendars right away, because we have Marie Yovanovitch, who is the former U.S. ambassador to Ukraine, who will be our speaker couldn't be more timely or relevant. Well, education represents the core of David Shulman, a successful investment banker with stints with Solomon Brothers and Lehman Brothers. He's now a managing director at Baruch College, where he mentors students at its Star Career Development Center. He's also an active blogger, where you may find his published book reviews, and not surprisingly, a very favorable book review for Master of the Game, which I happen to see. Now over to David. Um, good evening. Uh, <clears throat> uh, first, I'd like to introduce uh, uh, Jim Falk, who's uh, on my far right. Uh, he comes to Santa Fe uh, only about a year ago. He was president of the World Affairs Council of Dallas-Fort Worth, a position he held for two decades. And for whatever reason, they call him President Emeritus. I don't know why, but they, they, they do <laughs> Thanks that. Thanks a lot. <laughs> uh, he has a master's in foreign affairs from the University of Virginia with a focus on international law and Middle Eastern uh, politics. Now to introduce our uh, main speaker, uh, Ambassador Indyk. Since I had the pleasure of driving him from Albuquerque to Santa Fe, this Australian person is my mate. <laughs> G'day, mate. Right, a good mate uh, there. Uh, ambassador Indyk served uh, twice as ambassador to uh, Israel under the Clinton administration. He was Assistant Secretary of State for Near Eastern Affairs. Uh, he also was uh, President Obama's special envoy to Israel-Palestine in 2013 and uh, 2014. He also held a very high position at the Brookings Institution and where I discovered he was um, Fiona Hill's boss at the Brookings, at the Brookings in Institution. Mm -hmm. So with that, I don't think we uh, need any further introductions. It's all yours, Jim. Great, thank you so much. And David, let me take the opportunity just to thank you and Patricia for your support of tonight's program. Very, very grateful. And you're emeritus as well, so it's okay. <laughs> Martin, Ambassador, great to have you in Santa thank Fe. You, we appreciate it. Thanks for the warm welcome. Ah, uh, yeah. <laughs> so we are definitely going to talk about Ukraine because when you talk about master of the game, in some ways, I wish Kissinger were not 98, and let's hope that perhaps he is whispering in some ears right now, and I wouldn't be surprised if, if he is. But let's go back, God, it's hard to believe, let's go back almost 50 years. Where were you at the beginning of the Yom Kippur War? So, uh, first of all, thank you to the World Affairs Council, and Beth Shalom, for, for hosting me tonight. I'm very grateful to have an in-person engagement. The book came out in October and I've been doing virtual book talks until now and it's not the same when you can't see the people and they don't get to ask you the questions directly. Uh, so thank you uh, for having me. Uh, in 1973 I was an Australian student uh, enrolled at the Hebrew University to do a master's degree in international relations which was my passion uh, when the Yom Kippur War broke out. The Yom Kippur War was a surprise to Israel, a surprise to Henry Kissinger, and for sure was a surprise to me. Um, and uh, I uh, was in Jerusalem for that blackout. We watched it in Ukraine on our televisions, how, how these cities blacked out, and I, I lived in a very eerie feeling. And then... Um, I uh, worked on a kibbutz down south while the war was going on and, and I imagine, I don't think I really heard them, but I imagine I could hear the, the C5As and the C130s uh, delivering uh, American supplies, tanks uh, and material and aircraft um, to help Israel turn the tide of battle. Uh, and they were delivering them to an air, air base nearby. 
And then I would stay awake at night and listen to Voice of America and BBC World Service describing Henry Kissinger's um, engagement and uh, his efforts to achieve a ceasefire, which turned out to be quite successful. And it was during that time that I had a real kind of sense of, of uh, epiphany that I somehow wanted to uh, help to find a way uh, to make peace between Israel and its Arab neighbors. And that the epiphany was that the American role, and bear in mind I was in Australia, that the American role was critical in this, uh, both in terms of supporting Israel during the war, but then turning around and, and beginning the American-led peace process, which is what Kissinger did. And, and so I was, uh, was taken by that. I went back to Australia, wrote my PhD in part on what happened in, in 1973 in Kissinger's diplomacy there. And 20 years later, um, 1993, there I am going into the White House as Bill Clinton's Middle East advisor in the National Security Council, right at a moment when the stars seem to be completely aligned for a comprehensive peace in the Middle East. In fact, I told President Clinton in our first meeting that if he put his mind to it, he could have four peace agreements in his first term mm. and we'd have comprehensive peace uh, in the Middle East. And he looked at me and he said, I want to do that. And we were off. And for eight years, that's what we, we tried to do, Clinton and his peace team, of which I was a part. And we made great progress at the beginning with the Oslo Accords and the Israel-Jordan Peace Treaty. And then it kind of went downhill with Rabin's assassination. I was at that time ambassador in Israel. And, and uh, it, it really looked like it was cratering under the leadership of, of Prime Minister Netanyahu, who was determined to put the brakes on the whole process. And then out of the blue, Netanyahu's government collapses. Barack is elected. He asked Clinton to send me back to Israel to finish the job. Mm -hmm. And so we got the second chance. And it, we go to Camp David, and it blows up in our faces with the Intifada, thousands of deaths and casualties on both sides of the Israelis and Palestinians. And, um, you know, I left the government, and, and uh, the whole edifice of peacemaking had been destroyed. I got a third chance at it when uh, John Kerry became Secretary of State and asked me to uh, be his envoy for the Israeli-Palestinian negotiations that he had managed to uh, cobble together. Uh, and I, I did that for a year and it too ended in failure. And, and so, you know, the, the, the experience left me with this feeling that although it was easy to blame both sides, and they deserved it, um, I saw it up close. Uh, nevertheless, I, I believed that there was something fundamentally wrong with the way in which the United States was pursuing its role as the peace broker, as the honest broker. And uh, so I decided I'll go back, back to where I came in, and where the peace process began back in 1973, and try to understand from what Henry Kissinger did how to and how not to make peace in the Middle East. So that, that was the And, the and one of the things that I think makes this book so interesting, and Terrell, you will not want to read it because I have gone through it and marked it and turned the pages because this book is just one of the most fascinating books I've read on the Middle East. Okay. And you used the word a few minutes ago twice, surprise, about the Yom Kippur War, but it didn't need to be a surprise. Elaborate on how, yeah. particularly President Sadat, tried to tell people, I'm ready. Yeah, yeah. You know, Sadat um, came to power in, in 1970. Uh, he was universally uh, treated as a, as a fool Kissinger called him a buffoon. Uh, nobody took him seriously. He'd been in the shadows of Gamal Abdel Nasser, 
I think the Egyptian pan-Arab leader, a very charismatic uh, leader. And he uh, had kept his head down, so nobody really knew much about him. Uh, but he quickly consolidated power, and then he reached out to try to make peace uh, with Israel. And, and because nobody took him seriously, he started to threaten war to try to get them to take him seriously. And when he started to do that, his back of the Soviet Union said, no, 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 settle down. The last thing the Soviet Union wanted was Egypt to go to war because they were convinced it would lose. Mm -hmm. And Henry Kissinger, who by that point had taken over control of Middle East policy in Washington, was convinced that he could stabilize the situation simply by backing Israel's deterrent power. That a balance of power tipped in favor of Israel in the Middle East heartland and the Shah of Iran in the Gulf would stabilize that region together with the detente he had with the Soviet Union, which led him, well, I mean, they had agreed, he had agreed with Brezhnev that they wouldn't seek to exploit any opportunities in the Middle East for unilateral advantage. They would work together to keep it quiet. So he thought that it was all under control and that the Egyptians would never dare to go to war because they'd get beaten quickly by Israel. That was the CIA's assessment. Uh, that was certainly the Israeli intelligence assessment. And that was Kissinger's assessment. So Sadat tries one time one last time, uh, and sends his national security advisor to meet with Kissinger in Washington. Meets with Nixon, then meets with Kissinger outside of Washington in, in Armonk, New York, just outside of New York City. Why there? Because Kissinger, in his inimitable way, wanted to keep it a secret from the State Department. <laughs> so so they, they met up there. One of the first things Kissinger says to him is, don't you dare tell the State Department of this. Um, and Hafez Ismail, Sadat's national security advisor, comes with a far-reaching peace initiative. Uh, and Kissinger listens to it. He's quite excited by it. He takes it to Nixon. Nixon's quite excited. They see an opportunity here. And then a guy named Yitzhak Rabin comes in and sits with him. Yitzhak Rabin in those days was Golda Meir's ambassador in Washington. And Rabin listens to Kissinger's report and he says, forget about it. There's nothing new here. And Kissinger's very defensive and he says, well, it may not be new to you, but it's new to me. Robin says, nah, ridiculous. And then Golda Meir comes to town and she says, forget about it. No way, there's nothing here. And so Nixon and Kissinger backed off and went back to their default position, which was to maintain the order and stability by backing Israel. And for Sadat, that was the last straw. And he then, at that point, that was February of 1973, he then started planning for war. Now, it's interesting that in Kissinger's biography, he does not tell this story the way that I just told it. He says that Hafez Ismail came with nothing. It was just the usual Egyptian hardline position. And, and um, it's actually not true. And, and, you know, that's what's so interesting about your book, too, is that, and I'd, I'd like you to talk just for a few minutes about your research and how you were able to go to Dr. Kissinger and say, yeah, that's, that is what you said, but no, that's not what you said, Henry. <laughs> so. Yeah, so, <laughs> first of all, Henry Kissinger is a man of history and a student of history. And so he documented every conversation and every negotiation he had. Uh, by the way, he took all of his all of his papers with him, highly illegal. <laughs> he took everything with him when he left the state. He left a copy, but he took everything with him. Anyway, um, he, uh, he took... Well, he wrote 3,000 pages, right. so he needed it for his memoirs. That's exactly right. But anyway, 95% of that is available in the archives uh, now in, in the various presidential libraries. 
so I was able to uh, dig into those, and it's a real treasure trove. Uh, and then uh, the Israeli archives were open for that period, so I could kind of triangulate with those, and I was fortunate to have the opportunity to interview him. Uh, well, I did 12 formal interviews on the record. And, and he remembers a great deal, particularly about the 73 war, but also about other, other periods. And, but there were things that he chose not to remember, I think. So this particular story about Hafez Ismail, he, he kind of demurred on that. Um, but I have to say, he read, he read the book after it came out. He never challenged me on this account. And the point of this account is that if Kissinger had not been so wedded to his concept of the balance of power and the maintenance of order through the balance of power, had he not been uh, so willing to give way to Rabin and Golda's rejection, uh, he could have headed off the 73 war. Of course, that's conjecture on my part, but I believe that uh, he could have done it. And it informed his subsequent actions because he realised once the war broke out, not only that he had underestimated Sadat, but that his system for maintaining order didn't work. And therefore, he had to have a peace process to give the Arabs a stake in maintaining the order. That what was missing from his construct was a peace process that would legitimise the balance of power by giving the Arabs a stake in it. And, and so that's why he invented the peace process. We can get into this later, as it wasn't really about making peace. It was all about maintaining order. And, and go a bit farther. What do you mean by maintaining the order? Is that within just the Arab world and Israel? Or where did the Soviet Union fit into this? Right. So I think it's important to understand that that um, Kissinger, as a refugee from Nazi Germany, fled with his family as, as a teenager. Uh, Thirteen of his closest family perished in the Holocaust. And the chaos that he experienced there in Nazi Germany, I think, had a profound influence on him, although he doesn't freely admit it. Um, but that chaos led him to seek order in his own life and order in the international system. And by order, I mean a structure in which the states of the system, the countries that we know of, interact in a way that maintains the peace, not by ending conflict, but by ameliorating conflict by maintaining a balance of power in favour of those who support stability in the status quo so that those who would disrupt the order are unable to do so. That's his basic concept of order in the international system. But it is the superpowers, it's a hierarchical system. So the superpowers and the great powers have responsibility for maintaining this system and the smaller powers just have to go along. Sounds like Putin and, and Zelensky, right? So Kissing, that, that, was Kissing, that is Kissinger's view of the way order is maintained. Um, and his model for this was 19th century Europe, post-Napoleonic Europe, in which Metternich and Castlereagh, the foreign ministers of, of the great powers of Austria and Great Britain, developed this system of maintaining the order uh, exactly as I describe it. So that was his model. That's what he wrote his PhD on. That's what he published his first book on. And that really was his and, academic grounding. Right. And, and that's what he used to build detente with the Soviet Union, opening to China, although that was Nixon's idea. But that, that was all balance in the international system whereby his idea there, which is still very relevant today, was that the United States 
had to be friendlier with Russia and China than they were with each other in this triangular system of maintaining order. But he took that model and he applied it to the Middle East. So we're going to come back to the book, but let's do talk about Ukraine. What does Martin Indyk think are our options, and what does Henry Kissinger, would he think? You can take it in whatever order you exactly. wish. Exactly. <laughs> let, me, let me start with Kissinger. And then um, Kissinger hasn't written about this crisis. Uh, the reason for that is he's finishing another book at the age of 98. This is, this is on great leaders that he's known. Uh, Thatcher, De Gaulle, Lee Kuan Yew, Conrad Adenauer. After he read my book, he said he's adding Sadat. I was going to want to do a chapter on Sadat. And, and uh, so he, he's, he's under a uh, publisher's deadline at the moment. So he hasn't written. But he did write about Ukraine uh, in 2014 uh, when uh, Putin annexed Crimea. Uh, but I, I actually want to start with how he handled the Yom Kippur crisis because it's, it's all about crisis management in effect. And, and what he did there was work from the get-go for a ceasefire. The first attempt failed, and it failed because the Egyptians and the Syrians were not ready to stop the fighting. They felt that they could still achieve more by fighting. That was a lesson for him. So then he backed up Israel and urged the Israelis to launch counter-offensives, to head for Damascus, to put the pressure on the Syrians and the Egyptians so that they would agree to a ceasefire. So that was the first point, and it worked. Um, and, and what he sought was a ceasefire in place. Originally, his first attempt was a ceasefire in which the Egyptians and Syrians would withdraw. Um, but in, the second one was a simplified one, a ceasefire in place. So, and, and that's, that's what he established. And then he came in and negotiated a, an arrangement where both sides withdrew. Uh, that was the first uh, interim agreement between Israel and Egypt. Then he did another one between Israel and Syria. So that's, that was the Kissinger model. Now, how would you apply it today? Clearly, like the Egyptians and the Syrians, Putin is not ready to stop. That was tested yesterday when the foreign, foreign minister of Russia met the foreign minister of Ukraine and rejected any idea of, of stopping. So clearly Putin is not ready to stop. And so Biden, in, and this is my interpretation of applying 73, Biden has to find a way to convince Putin that to keep on going, to take Kiev uh, will be so painful for him that it's not worth it and that he needs to agree to a ceasefire. Um, and that's not going to be easy to do. I suspect it actually won't work. If you listen to uh, Bill Burns, the director of the CIA, uh, yesterday, I think, mm -hmm. the day before he gave testimony uh, in the Congress, uh, he said their estimation is that Putin intends to double down. Uh, and you can see uh, the way that his forces are surrounding Kyiv that, that he's preparing basically to take, take the city. And, and uh, so I, I'm afraid that the leverage that Kissinger had in 73 doesn't have, uh, uh, he wouldn't have in this situation. Uh, and that means that if I'm right, uh, Putin will take Kyiv. There will be a tremendous loss of life, huge displacement of refugees, much greater than what we've seen up to now. And, and, um, but there will be a resistance to, to his... Uh, he won't be able to swallow Ukraine. And, and Western support, European support, for that resistance is going to 
extract a very high price uh, on Putin, such that, that he will reach a point where I think he will decide that he has to get out of, out of uh, Ukraine. But it's going to be a long time coming, I'm afraid. I think it's so interesting that the Israeli Prime Minister, relatively recently in his office, Naftali Bennett, is serving as a mediator and even went to Moscow. What's the backstory to that? So, uh, Bennett has uh, good relations with Ukraine and, and with Russia. Uh, that, Why? Uh, I mean, Ukraine, because I guess the large there's Jewish a large population. Jewish community, and, and so the connections are. But why would are, Putin are there? Uh, in 2015, you recall that that Putin sent uh, his forces, and particularly his air force, into Syria to back up the Assad regime, and um, they're still there today. Um, they succeeded in bolstering the Assad regime together with the Iranians to the point where he is, uh, Assad has survived. Uh, he doesn't yet have control of the whole country, it's a kind of stalemate now, but, but his regime is, is intact. But it will only stay intact as long as the Russians stay there. So that means that the Russians are on Israel's border. And Israel has a problem in Syria because the Iranians are using Syrian territory to transfer precision-guided missiles to Hezbollah, which Hezbollah can use to rocket Israeli cities. And, and, and they've got something absurd, like 150,000 uh, various kinds of rockets uh, in, in Iran, but they, in uh, uh, Lebanon, but they don't have uh, precision-guided weapons. So the Israelis are bombing Iranian positions in Syria to stop that from happening and to try to stop the pro-Iranian militias that are trying to move up onto the Golan Heights to open another border uh, conflict with Israel. There's Hezbollah in, in southern Lebanon on Israel's northern border, um, Hamas in Gaza that the Iranians support and, and then they will be on the Golan Heights. So the Israelis are using their air force and, uh, to to basically prevent these two things from happening. They're only able to do it because the Russians turn a blind eye. Now, only in the Middle East, right, you would have such a situation where the Russians are allied with the Iranians to back up the Assad regime, but they're allowing the Israelis to bomb the Iranians so as to keep the Iranians in place because they're actually rivals uh, for control of Syria. Uh, so the Israelis have to be very careful about not baiting the Russian bear. At the same time, how can they not support a Western right. democracy, a um, small country like Israel that is overtaken by, by an aggressive, unprovoked aggressive act of of its superpower neighbor. So they try to walk between the raindrops. And the best way to do that is on the one hand to condemn the Russian invasion, but on the other hand, to try to mediate. And because Bennett has a relationship with both Zelensky and Putin, he has done that. It's, you know, I don't criticize him for trying, not at all, but his chances of success are, are between zero and none. He doesn't have any leverage on, on Putin. He doesn't have any means of stopping him. And uh, so, therefore, there's not much he can do except listen to what Putin says and tell Zelensky that's what he says and vice versa, and tell Biden that. Um, but it's, it's a way for Israel to, to kind of avoid taking a clear stand uh, on the side of Ukraine and. Uh, on the side of the United States. Um, and and it, just last point about this, it is a reflection of what has happened in the Middle East as a result of America's retrenchment from that region, as a result of, of um, starting in the Obama years but carried on by Trump and now by Biden, this 
this view that the American people have had it with the Middle East, have had it with wars in the Middle East, and they want out. And, and uh, as a result of that and the rise of China and Putin's much more aggressive behaviour, we have pivoted away from the Middle East. And everybody in the region gets that. Yeah. And while we're pulling out, Russia is there. Well, we saw that and this week with the UAE and Saudi Arabia not exactly. supporting. Exactly. And so this is the new Middle East. And it's kind of shocking because it's like lifting the rug off and now seeing or, you know, what's underneath. What's underneath is countries, including Israel, that don't feel they can rely on the United States anymore. And therefore, they're hedging with Russia and with China. Um, and, and as a result, our ability to influence them has decreased. What do you think, though, about the Abraham Accords? Because you certainly are seeing, I think, general fatigue among the many of the Arab countries about the Palestinian-Israeli issue. And as you said earlier when we were talking in our virtual green room here, there really is no peace process going on. Yeah. Uh, do you, so, are, you, are you positive about the Abraham Accords? Yes, absolutely. But let, let me go back to Kissinger. Always. <laughs> If uh, I spent eight years writing a book, I'd go back right. to Kissinger too. <laughs> so, so <laughs> Kissinger uh, had this really jaundiced view of peace. He, he in, in the first book that he wrote, he, he, the title of the book, which was his doctoral dissertation, was uh, A World Restored, Metternich, Castlereagh, and the Problems of Peace. So it was right there in the title. And it's there on the first page where he talks about the paradox of peace, that peace pursued with too much enthusiasm and energy by leaders can have the opposite result, can actually produce war. Now, of course, he was thinking about appeasement leading to mm -hmm. World War II and the breakdown of the order that Metternich and Castlereagh had produced after 100 years in the First World War. And he, when it come, came to the Middle East, he was particularly concerned that American leaders, with their sense of divine providence, that a special responsibility for exporting our democracy and making peace particularly in the Middle East with the holy grail of peace between Israel and the Arabs, peace in Jerusalem, that, that they would pursue it with too much energy and enthusiasm. His approach, his belief, was that peace would come eventually hmm. over a long period of time when the powers involved in conflict exhausted themselves. And... Uh, Therefore, it was a mistake to try to jump to an end of conflict, end of claims kind of peace agreement. He didn't believe it would last. And in his negotiations with the Arabs and Israelis, when they said they wanted to make peace, he said, no, you don't want that. That's not worth having. It won't last. Would you? Uh, so instead, he introduced this idea of a step-by-step -step process, an incremental process that would buy time for the Arabs to exhaust themselves, for Israel to strengthen itself, so that eventually, when they were ready, the Arabs were ready to make peace, Israel would be strong enough to make the ter necessary territorial concessions to end the conflict. That was his model. That's what he, what he did. Um, so today, with the Abraham Accords, you used the word tired of or exhausted, exhausted. The Abraham Accords occurred exactly on Kissinger's timetable. 40 years for, for the Emiratis and the Bahrainis and the Moroccans and the Sudanese, sort of, um, to recognize Israel, to normalize relations with Israel. And, and what did the Crown Prince of Abu Dhabi say 
he was the prime mover in this, we're tired of the conflict. Um, they're exhausted by it. They have a more important conflict that they have to worry about with Iran, right. where Israel is an ally. And so uh, we have, I mean, peace between countries that weren't really at war with Israel, but nevertheless, it creates a momentum and a, uh, the warmth of the peace between Israel and Bahrain and the UAE is creating kind of space for Egypt and Jordan um, to warm up their peace, which had been cold peace because of the lack of progress on the Palestinian issue. Now they are warming up their peace with Israel because they too have a strategic interest in doing so. And what are they doing? Egypt is moving into Gaza to help the Palestinians in Gaza in a way that has never done before. And Jordan is starting to do that in the West Bank. That's really important because in, in my view, the only way in which we're gonna be able to rebuild an Israeli-Palestinian peace process is by an incremental step-by-step -step Kissingerian approach with the help of Egypt and Jordan as the, as, as the anchors for the Palestinian state. We're going to open it up for questions in a minute, but I'd, I'd like you to underscore with this example of what you just said, that on March 15, 1975, Henry Kissinger and Assad were talking, and it was a missed opportunity, perhaps. Tell that story, and then we'll open yeah, it up. Yeah, this was, for me, a really fascinating part of the, the documentary research. Um, in 1975, Kissinger was negotiating a second agreement between Israel and Egypt, which would have the effect of taking Egypt out of the conflict with Israel. And from that point on, made it impossible for any other Arab state to contemplate going to war with Israel. It was in effect the end, 1975 was the end of the state-to-state -state conflict between the Arabs and Israel because of that agreement. And that had the effect of isolating Assad in Syria. He essentially lost his leverage once Egypt made this agreement uh, with Israel. Kissinger knew that he had a problem with Syria, that he had to kind of keep Assad sweet in order to do this deal with, with uh, Sadat, because otherwise Assad could cause a lot of trouble for him in the Arab world. So he kept on going to Damascus, even though he had nothing for Assad. He was just kind of doing what we call the yada yada. Um, and amazingly, because he doesn't write it in, in his memoirs at all, he doesn't refer to it, Assad tells him on one of these visits in 1975 that he's ready for peace. Uh, that his people are ready for peace. And, and that this is a real contrast with what he had told Kissinger initially in 1973 when they first met. And he said his people are not ready for peace and they're not ready to sit with Israel. And they is not, you know, we can only do a disengagement agreement. So now suddenly Assad is trying to, is trying to tell Kissinger that he's ready. Uh, and why was he ready? Because he understood at that point that if Sadat went ahead without him, he was going to be left high and dry. Uh, and, and Kissinger, because of his jaundiced view of peace, didn't take him up on it. And, and they have this philosophical discussion about, about peace and justice and uh, essentially Kissinger walks away and and doesn't pursue it. I wish we had time to talk more about the relationships that Kissinger had with Assad, which was very surprising, Sadat, which grew, and King Hussein, who he liked, but really saw as inconsequential. Right, so just a point on, on, on King Hussein of Jordan, because that was another missed opportunity. And then we will open it up, but yeah, tell us. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, he, as you say, he liked the king. Uh, but you remember I talked about the high, uh, hierarchy of states that, that uh, mattered to Kissinger. 
So Jordan was a small state, surrounded by bigger Arab states in Israel, had very limited power, and therefore was of no great consequence in the balance of power that he was constructing. Egypt was critical. So after he did the agreement with Egypt and the agreement with Syria, the king knocked on the door, said he wanted a disengagement agreement. Now, the king had not gone to war in 73. He'd got a pass by the other Arabs because he had lost the West Bank and Jerusalem in the 67 war. And so as a result, he didn't have his forces engaged with Israel. But he was ready to move into the West Bank, into Jericho, giving him a foothold in the West Bank which would have put him in a position to act as the custodian for the Palestinians. Uh, Kissinger, because he didn't value the king, uh, was intrigued by the idea of a disengagement agreement there, told the Israelis, you better do this, you better take the Jordanians seriously, because if you don't, the PLO will come to represent the Palestinians, and then you'll have a real problem. Uh, but he said to the Israelis repeatedly, don't expect me to get involved. Don't expect, I'm not going to pressure you on this one. And, and uh, without that, the Israelis sat with the Jordanians, had a number of meetings, but without Kissinger's involvement, there was no way they were going to be able to do the deal. And the moment was lost, and sure enough, Ten months later, the Arab uh, League, in its wisdom, declared the PLO the sole legitimate representative of the Palestinians, and Jordan, since then, has been sidelined, mm -hmm. unable to play its role. That's why I think it's important that they're now carefully coming back in and, and being willing to, to uh, play a role. So I'd like to open it up to you. Uh, we have a microphone. Um, Jesse is going to hold the microphone and take your questions. And I always have to say this, especially when we're talking about the Middle East, questions begin with what, where, how, why, when, and should be relatively brief. Um, but we do want to hear your questions. So if you would raise your hand, and we'll take your questions. Questions also end in a question mark. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> questions also end with a question mark. Who else has a question so we can move the mic over? And I still have about four or five pages, so. It's one down there. Go ahead, sir. Golda Meir famously said, it is impossible to negotiate with the man who came to kill you. What do you think Golda Meir would say today about the situation in Israel, the Middle East in general, and Ukraine? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. Um, first of all, she may have said that, but she negotiated with Sadat and, and uh, made uh, a you know, critical concession of withdrawing Israeli forces from the East Bank of, of the, uh, from the West Bank of the Canal, I should say, uh, where they threatened Cairo. Um, that uh, was a knockdown, drag-out fight between Kissinger and, and Golda um, because she, was, she, she had exactly the attitude that, that you quoted. Um, she didn't see why Israel should have to give up any territory when Egypt was the one that launched war. And Kissinger, uh, through his words more than any threat, but through his words and explaining to her how Israel had to do this for its own future. And he convinced her. It's a fascinating exchange that I, that I detail in the book. So she, she converted uh, from that attitude to being, a, being willing not only to give up territory um, to Egypt, but also giving up territory to Syria. Uh, and, and so what, what would she say today? I, th I think that Golda would be uh, 
much more willing to stand up to Putin and stand with Ukraine. Uh, and I say that because of an interesting incident that occurred in 1970 when Egypt and Israel were engaged in a war of attrition over the Suez Canal. Gamal Abdel Nasser had tried to uh, use uh, artillery shelling of Israel's position on, on the east bank of the canal to force them to withdraw. And, and when the Israelis used their air force to do strategic bombing in Egypt, Nasser went to the Soviets. And the Soviets came in to Egypt like they did, as we were discussing, in Syria in 2015. In 1970, they came into Egypt with Soviet piloted MiGs to try to stop the Israelis from uh, the strategic bombing campaign. And Golda was prime minister, and Dayan was, Moshe Dayan was defense minister. And they decided to shoot down the Soviet MiGs. And they shot down six Soviet piloted MiGs over the Suez Canal. And what did the Soviets do? Nothing. Uh, whereas on the other side, she, she was um, very strongly of the view that, from her own experience, that Israel you know, was an embattled democracy that, that had to stand up to aggression. Um, so I, th I think she would have uh, calculated a little differently than, than Prime Minister Bennett. Um, but I don't, you know, I don't blame him. Israel has a real security challenge on its border there. And uh, to, to bait the, the Russian the bear at this, at this moment, when the United States is about to do a, a deal with Iran that will uh, enable it to have access to a lot more funds to support its efforts in Iran, in uh, Syria, I think, um, you know, you've got to weigh that case carefully. Mm. Other questions, please? Yes, ma'am, if you'll just wait for a minute for the microphone. Other questions so we can move the mic? Yes, sir, I see you. Great. Okay. Um, do you think it's too late for a two-state solution? Thank you for that question. Uh, no, I do not. Uh, and I say that because of the word solution. Uh, all of the other ideas out there are not solutions. They're just recipes for continuing the conflict. Uh, to end the conflict, uh, there has to be uh, a separation of Israelis from the Palestinians, an end to the Israeli occupation, and the establishment of a Palestinian state. We know what it looks like. You know, I've, I've been in so many negotiations between the Israelis and the Palestinians, in particular the last one, in which they've discussed what the final deal should look like. The United States has developed, I developed with, with Secretary Kerry, bridging positions, ideas that could, could bridge the differences between them. Uh, but we can't get there from here. Uh, and, and we have to go back to a Kissingerian incremental approach. Why? Because the Intifada and, and what came after it has convinced both sides that the other side doesn't want peace. And neither side believes in the intentions of the other. So whereas there would still be, if, if you could change that, there would still be a majority in both sides in favour of a two-state solution. Today, they don't believe it can ever happen. And, and so they've lost faith in it, and they don't press their leaders at all to pursue it. To the extent that the Palestinians press their leaders to do anything, it's, it's to push for equal rights in Israel, which is a rabbit hole that's not going to not going to get them anywhere. Um, and, and the Israelis 
basically have turned their backs on the Palestinians, put up a wall, a fence, and, and got on with life. Uh, and the left, which advocates for peace in Israel, has basically given up as well. In the last four elections uh, in Israel, the Palestinian issue was never raised in those elections. So how do you rebuild from here? You need a step-by-step -step process. The Israeli government is a left-right coalition. It cannot agree on what the outcome should be. Half of them support it, two-state solution, half of them oppose it. So they can't move forward. Um, on the Palestinian side, you've got uh, Hamas on one side and, and the Palestinian Authority on the other. They can't agree on what the outcome should be. Hamas seeks the destruction of Israel. Uh, the Palestinian Authority seeks peace with it. Anyway, so that you can't, there's, there's no consensus there about what the objective should be. But the Israeli government is prepared to take steps, is taking steps. 150,000 Palestinians now work in Israel from the West Bank. You probably don't know this, but between 10 and 20,000 Palestinians from Gaza are now working in Israel. Mm -hmm. And the Israeli government is prepared to up those numbers quite, quite dramatically in Gaza to give the Gazans a stake in maintaining stability. Um, they have the 60% of the West Bank that is under Israel's complete control which Naftali Bennett, the Prime Minister, wants to annex, um, but can't because of his coalition government. Uh, they're now granting uh, permits for uh, 2,000 Palestinian units, building housing units in that Area C, it's called. Um, that doesn't sound like a lot. It's not a lot, but it's a start. And they're starting to, to lease territory in Area C to the Palestinians long-term leasing, 100-year leasing or so on. So they can set up a large solar farm to provide renewable energy uh, for the Palestinians. Um, and so these are, these are little steps. Now, Kissinger would tell them that if it's to be a viable process, it has to have a territorial dimension. It can't just be economic steps. Um, and because that, that's what his peace process was all about. The Oslo Accords, much uh, derided by both sides today, was Yitzhak Rabin's uh, effort to introduce a Kissingerian incremental process to dealing with the Palestinians. There was no end game provided for there. There was nothing about Jerusalem, nothing about a Palestinian state, uh, nothing about refugees. It was just an incremental process of Israeli army withdrawal from parts of the West Bank in three stages. Uh, there is provision. The Oslo Accords is the only agreement that the Israelis and Palestinians have. They haven't gotten rid, rid of it. It still governs their relations. There's provision for a third further redeployment. Israel could take a territorial step out of Area C uh, that would give the Palestinians a sense that the occupation could end and that they could get more territory under their control. Uh, and that would start to in infuse some hope on the Palestinian side. So it's that kind of thing that I think uh, needs to be done. I don't expect it's going to happen in my lifetime that, that uh, we'll see it. But, you know, I, I feel that after the last effort uh, we made that ended in failure in 2014, a friend of mine said, you've had your Mount Nebo moment. <laughs> Mount Nebo, of course, was the place in Jordan where God took Moses to see the promised land and told him, you won't, you won't be crossing into it. So that was my Mount Nebo moment. I've seen the promised land. I've seen what a two-state solution looks like. I sat there hour after hour 
<laughs> I bet it's, you heard a lot of talk about it. Let's take the last question. Jesse, it's in the far back. Uh, General, Je could you raise your hand again so she can see you? Thank you. We'll have one more question, perhaps. <laughs> I'll make a short answer. All right. <laughs> I have a two-part uh, uh, question. First, what do you think is behind Erdogan of Turkey's initiative toward Israel right now, and maybe perhaps even Saudi Arabia's uh, change? And is it the Iranian nuclear threat that is really behind it, and the nuclear power from Iran? And what do you think of the negotiations going on between America and Iran, or the allies oh, in Iran? That's a two big questions. <laughs> <laughs> Look at the Middle East today. It's really quite stunning. Uh, the President of Israel is visiting Turkey with full honors after 10 years of the worst possible relations between Erdogan and Israel. Saudi Arabia is refusing, the, the Crown Prince is refusing to take a call from the President and refusing to use its excess capacity, and it's the only oil producing country that has real excess capacity, something like one to two million barrels per day, refusing to, to put its oil on, on the market to play its traditional role of uh, tamping down prices when they get too high. That's what it's all, always done in the past. Not doing it now. Why? Because there's an agreement with Russia uh, in what's called OPEC Plus to maintain quotas, despite the spike in prices. Um, and the United States is about to do a deal with Iran to freeze its nuclear program and bring Iranian oil onto the market. So, you know, something wrong with this picture. But it's the Middle East. But it's the Middle East. And as I said, it's the price of retrenchment by the United States that, that every, everybody is making their own calculations about where their interests lie. There's no longer a dominant power that they have to pay respect to. The nuclear deal itself <coughs> is uh, far from an ideal uh, deal. But the reason why it's important to do it now is because Trump, with the encouragement of Bibi Netanyahu, made the terrible mistake of tearing up the agreement, walking out of the agreement. And the Iranians stuck with it for a year, wanting to see whether they, the Europeans could deliver some change in the American position. When that didn't come, clear, didn't come about, they uh, broke the agreement too. And they have been uh, enriching uranium to 60% now, introducing new, far more advanced uh, centrifuges that can get them from 60% to 90% bomb grade uranium uh, very quickly. Whereas when the original nuclear deal was struck, uh, Iran was one year from a bomb. Today it's weeks from a bomb. So we need the agreement because it will freeze the program, remove the uranium that Iran has enriched, reinstate the inspections, including surprise inspections, get Iran to account for the nuclear research that has been doing that's unaccounted for, and give us some time, go back to a Kissingerian notion, time to try to negotiate a better deal. Now, it's not going to be so simple to do. But we sure as hell aren't going to be able to negotiate a better deal unless we've got the Iranians back at the table, unless we've got the Iranian nuclear deal frozen. And so even though it's not a great deal, given the circumstances, it's, the, it, it's I think, the best that we can do. Uh, it doesn't address Iran's um, nefarious activities in the region, which are a real problem. Uh, for Israel, for Saudi Arabia, for the Emirates, and so on. Um, but uh, it at least uh, stops the nuclear program and therefore stops the need for other powers in the region to go down the nuclear path as well. 
which we'd have a kind of nuclear arms race in the Middle East, which would, would be a real disaster. Oh, you still, what, bring the mic up one, for one last question, and then I have a few very quick closing notes. How are you, Martin? <laughs> Amazing to see you. <laughs> Wonderful to see you again. During the eight years of President Clinton, when you were up to your ears in the Middle East peace process, President Mubarak was a constant present at all times. Would you care to elaborate on his influence? Uh, I happen to think that he was the ultimate moderate Arab leader at the time who had to sit at the table, but perhaps I'm totally wrong. Well, I don't know whether you know this lady in your midst, but she can tell you all about it. <laughs> she has the inside stories. Amazing. Stand up so everybody can see you. <laughs> she knows the intimate details of every foreign leader's sleeping arrangements <laughs> at Blair House. And believe me, they're worth telling. I, are you going to write a book? You did? <laughs> I, how, how I'm delighted to hear that. So President Hosni Mubarak, well, Hosni Mubarak had none of the flair of, of Anwar Sadat. Uh, he had been his vice president. Uh, but his, his, he was deeply committed to uh, the alliance with the United States, and to playing a stabilizing role uh, in the region. Um, and so uh, he was a great partner to the United States, particularly uh, in the first uh, war against Saddam Hussein and the efforts to, successful efforts to drive him out of Kuwait. Um, and uh, we, you know, he, he was a strategic partner. He maintained the peace with Israel, albeit a cold peace. Uh, but he was very cautious. And you know, I think that was a product of his experience, where he was on the reviewing stand with Sadat. And, and when the assassins mm -hmm. came for Sadat, they pointed at Mubarak and said, get out of the way. We're going for Sadat. Um, so I don't think he ever forgot that. Uh, and he was subject to two more assassination attempts. Uh, so he's very cautious. Unlike Sadat, who took on the Muslim Brotherhood, he wasn't prepared to do that. Instead, he, he, he would say to us, don't press me to open up Egypt democratically, uh, to allow greater freedom here, because the alternative to me will be the Muslim Brotherhood. And we, we went along with that for a long time until George H. Bush came along and decided he was going to democratize the Middle East and he was going to start with Egypt. And, and uh, that caused a lot of strain and eventually um, came the Arab Spring and uh, President Obama told Mubarak to go, uh, which he did. And guess what came after him, the Muslim Brotherhood. Uh, so uh, that act uh, by the United States, uh, I think together with Obama's uh, unwillingness to enforce his own red line in Syria when Assad dropped chemical weapons on his own people, uh, really had a profound impact on, on the Arab leaders. Because if we were prepared to turn on our best ally in the region, our most reliable and most important Arab ally, like that, uh, when the people came out in the streets against him, then they had to assume that we'd turn on them too. Uh, and, and so that combination, I think, really had a profound impact. And, and we're seeing the results today. Ambassador, I feel another book coming out of you on this. <laughs> Martin Indyk, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you very much. So, ladies and gentlemen, before you go outside, I see Diana MacArthur there, um, who is our presenting sponsor for the gala on May 18th. It's going to sell out, so I hope that you will go to our website as soon as possible.
We've announced our spring program. Paul Salomon, we were talking about President of the Middle East Institute, uh, Ben Rhodes, and George Friedman. So please, I hope you'll support the council and, and spread the word. But one of the reasons that we are able to bring speakers into Santa Fe is if you will consider purchasing a copy of the book. You're gonna enjoy it, but it also makes a difference for us to be able to call, don't wanna embarrass you, sir, and say, uh, one of the reasons we're able to get people like Martin Indyk is if we can go back and say, we sold all the books that we had. So I hope you'll consider that. Think of it as a, a price of admission to come, and I promise you, I promise you that, uh, that you will enjoy this book and you'll learn a lot. It's a terrific, terrific read. Thanks again for being with us. Hope to see you very soon again. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.